Hello Chem students. I'm going to uh, go through chapter 9. I think I'm going to try and do it in three lectures since it's a pretty long topic. As you go through you might uh, stop a slide if you don't exactly understand what's going on. Kind of look it over a little bit, maybe go back and listen to it again. Uh, maybe that would help. If there's a problem or something you might think about it before uh, you see the answer. So. Let's go ahead and get started. This is going to be on uh, SN2 and E2 chemistry, and also SN1 and E1 chemistry. Um, I'm going to start off with the uh, SN2 and E2 reactions first, and uh, then we'll look at SN1, E1, and some other details later. Uh, this is a lot of the vocabulary. I won't go through each of these terms here, but you might stop the slide and read through it, and uh, see if you uh, understand some, some of these terms, all of these terms. Hopefully by the end of the topic, uh, they will all mean something to you. In any case, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Now we're going to look at four mechanisms. These are SN2 and E2 that compete with each other, and also SN1 and E1 that compete with each other. Uh, S stands for substitution. Uh, in all of these compounds, in all these reactions, there will be a leaving group. Uh, there are a variety of leaving groups, but we will use bromide as the uh, main leaving group of this topic. Uh, that will be lost from one of the carbons, and uh, that will allow the reaction to proceed. Uh, we're going to use N. If there's a nucleophile involved, a nucleophile is looking for something positive. That will be the car partial positive carbon that has, has the bromine atom. Uh, the nucleophile will donate two electrons, just like a base does, Lewis base in our last topic. Uh, so they share a lot of similarities there. And in fact, the competing reactions it will be actually the same thing that is the nucleophile and the base. E will stand for uh, elimination reactions. Uh, elimination reactions basically take away two groups that are on connected carbons and make a pi bond between those carbons. So the carbon with the bromine will be the C-alpha carbon and any carbon attached to that carbon will be the C uh, beta carbon. Uh, one will stand for unimolecular kinetics, which means there's only one thing involved in the slow step of the reaction that will show up in the rate law. So down here that would be the bromoalkane, or what I sometimes call the Rx compound. So the rate will only depend on how fast that can react. Two stands for bimolecular kinetics, meaning there's two concentration terms in the rate law. So the Rx compound, or the bromoalkane, will always be involved. But in this case, uh, when the nucleophile is minus charged, it will also participate in the reaction. And so both of those things will determine the rate. If we look down here, we can see uh, the Rx compound, or the bromoalkane, is composed of a leaving group. For us, that'll be bromide. But also possible would be chloride, bromide, iodide, tosylate, and even protonated alcohols. So uh, we will look at bromide, bromide leaving groups and a little bit of the protonated alcohol. Anyway, so that will be leaving, and when it leaves, something else will happen. Uh, if something comes in and takes its place, that will be a substitution. And if we lose a proton on the C-beta carbon, that will make a pi bond, that will be elimination. Our first clue as to what kind of reaction can go on will be the charge on the nucleophile base. And so uh, I have a minus charge written over here. We have many, many variations of this, but you want to look at them all as just being an anion. And so these will be involved in SN2 and E2 reactions. And some conditions will favor SN2, and some conditions will favor E2, and some conditions will have um, a moderately even competition between the two. On the other side, over here, we have also nucleophile bases, but this time there's a proton on it, and uh, they still have a pair of electrons that will be the nucleophile base part, but they're very weak. And so these do not react until the Rx compound uh, begins the reaction. So the rate will only depend on this, and that's why they are called 1 reactions. So if a nucleophile replaces X, it will be Sn1. And if a base pulls off an adjacent proton, it'll be an E1. Okay, so nucleophiles and bases are electron pair donors, and the Rx compound is electron pair acceptor, and sometimes that's also referred to as an electrophile. 
Okay, the R part is the carbon part, and so these are patterns that we've talked about, methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. Allylic and benzylic are especially reactive in these reactions here. So we want to be familiar with all those patterns. What I have on this slide is a whole collection of uh, bromoalkanes from C1 to C6. And so you can see it's quite a group, and it looks pretty overwhelming if you're trying to look at each of these specifically. But that's not the way we want to look at them. We want to look at them as general patterns. And so as general patterns, we just have a few. Uh, the first one is a methyl pattern. That's unique. There's only one of those, just a CH3 bromine. But the primary pattern has a, a bromine on a carbon that only has one other carbon attached, and that's why it's called primary. So we have lots of those here. Here's a primary, here's a primary, here's a primary, here's a primary, and many more down the page. The next one would be a secondary. A secondary has a carbon with a bromine, uh, and that's called the C-alpha carbon. And there's two carbons attached. Okay, that's, that, that's what makes it secondary. So here's a secondary, here's a secondary, secondary, secondary. So there's quite a few secondaries on the page too. The next pattern that we want to look at is a, a carbon with the bromine having three carbons attached, and that's called a tertiary. So here's a tertiary, and uh, here's another tertiary. Should be some more here. Here's a tertiary right here. So there's a few of those too. Now, uh, down at the bottom, I have a couple that are especially reactive that I mentioned on the previous slide. Allyl, in this case it's a primary allyl because the carbon with the bromine only has one carbon attached, but there's a pi bond next to that carbon. And so that's going to allow for resonance structures and resonance conditions that make it react better. If I had a benzene ring next to a CH2, a primary CH2 here uh, with the bromine, that would be a benzyl type position. And these could be primary or secondary or tertiary, both of them, but uh, highly reactive. If I have the bromine directly attached to the benzene ring, which is kind of confusing because of this one over here, uh, that's very unreactive. Okay, And the same is true when it's directly attached to the double bond, which we call a vinyl group. So that would be phenyl and vinyl, and we say those are very unreactive. There's a, one pattern in here that is especially unreactive. And that's the primary neopental. Okay, so I have a primary because there's only one carbon attached to the carbon with the bromine. But if I look at this part here, there's a quaternary carbon in the middle. It's completely surrounded by one carbon units. This is called primary neopental. It does not react by any of our mechanisms. Uh, I have another neopental. Here's another primary neopental. That one does not react by any of our mechanisms. This is a secondary neopental. It does not react by SN2, but it reacts by all the other possibilities. Okay, so this is the way we want to learn it. We want to learn it by these general patterns that I have shown here. First one is methyl, which is unique. Here's a primary, and you'll notice I just use R to indicate any of the other carbon portions that are up on the previous slide. So there's just one carbon attached to the carbon with the bromine. The secondary, there's two carbons attached to the carbon with the bromine. The tertiary, there's three carbons attached to the carbon with the bromine. Here's that neopental pattern, but we only include this because it doesn't react with anything, and you should be aware of that. So let's come back up and look at the conditions. The conditions are the first thing that you want to look at on these reactions. If there is a minus charge, as I have drawn here, then you want to call this a 2 reaction. So it'll be SN2 versus E2. Okay, because it has the minus charge, it's not as stable, and it forces itself into the reaction. Uh, if we look at um, all these conditions down the line, I have them all with the minus charge. So with the methyl in our course, uh, the only reaction that will occur at a methyl is SN2 when we have a minus charge. That's it. No other reactions. It does not react by E2. does not react by SN1 or E1. E2 requires a second carbon to make a pi bond, and there's only one carbon. So this is pretty easy. It can only react if there's minus, and it only does SN2. If we go to the primary, it's still pretty easy with a minus charge. Almost everything we look at is mainly SN2, a little bit of E2, but we're not going to emphasize that a lot. Just be aware of it. Um, so all of our strong base nucleophiles, we'll say, are mainly SN2, except there's one, uh, we call it potassium T-butoxide. The T-butoxide is very basic and very big and bulky, 
and that does not favor SN2. Since it's a primary position, it does not react by SN1 or E1. So mostly SN2 at primary centers, except for that one exception. Secondary is the problem, because at secondary, we can do all the reactions. For many of the uh, nucleophile bases that we talk about with a minus charge, it'll be SN2. And so these will be fairly stable minus charges, like ethanoic, or cyanide, or sulfur nucleophiles, or azide, or the hydrides, aluminum hydride or borohydride, or enolates. Okay? So these will be mainly SN2, and that'll be our, our proposal for uh, predicted products. If the nucleophile base is big and bulky, or if it's pretty basic, then E2 tends to be the winner. And so that would be, say, for hydroxide, alkoxides, acetylides, and also when we have um, hysterically large dialkyl uh, amides. Uh, secondary can undergo SN1 and E1 when there's a weak nucleophile. And for us, that'll be water and alcohol and carboxylic acids, simple carboxylic acids. We're going to eliminate the carboxylic acids just to keep life a little easier. We'll mainly look at water and alcohols. A complication of these reactions will be rearrangement, but we'll talk about that later. If we have a tertiary uh, bromoalkane, uh, then SN2 is dead. It's too sterically bulky to allow backside attack of the base nucleophile. And so with strong base nucleophiles, we only get E2. And E2 occurs by a very specific route that you'll have to be familiar with. The problem is there's three C betas, and so you might have a different reaction going on at each C beta. Uh, tertiary compounds are very good for SN1 and E1. So they will occur, and again, we're just going to mainly use water and alcohol for those two. That'll be pretty easy. Uh, but they ionize first, and then uh, we'll say that SN1 is the main product over the E1 product, except for one, one exception. That'll be when we have alcohols and strong acid with heat. In all of these reactions, uh, rearrangement is possible, and that makes it a little more complicated. Remember, neopental doesn't react by anything, no mechanism. Allyl and benzyl patterns are very reactive by all four mechanisms, and vinyl and phenyl are very unreactive by all four mechanisms. So just extra little details to keep track of. Now you'll notice on these conditions, there is no minus charge. These are what we call weak nucleophile base conditions. We have the same patterns, methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary, neopental doesn't react. Okay. So on these reactions, something has to happen first. The leaving group over here, the leaving group has to leave, make bromide, and a carbocation. So making carbocations is tough. And if we all we have is the methyl, it's too high energy in our course to do that. Okay, so solution chemistry is very difficult to do that. And so the, the answer here is if you have a neutral uh, base nucleophile, uh, no, no, uh, no product, okay, no reaction. If we go to primary, it's a little better for the carbocation, but not good enough. So still, we do not get a reaction by SN1 or E1, so the answer would be no reaction or no product. So that makes it pretty easy. That's half of our choices here. Methyl and primary is no reaction with a weak base nucleophile. However, when we get to secondary, we will be able to form the carbocation. And as I said, SN1 is favored over E1 for the product formation in our course. And we won't be using carboxylic acids, just water and alcohol. The part that will be a little challenging is uh, rearrangements, but uh, we'll do that later. And then, of course, the E1 reaction with alcohols and sulfuric acid and heat. Tertiary works very good for SN1, E1, but we have all those other complications about um, rearrangements and so forth. Neo, primary neopental, no reaction. Okay, allyl and benzyl, even at primary, they can form carbocations because of resonance. And then vinyl and phenyl do not react. So let's just take a look at these. Uh, maybe stop the slide and think it through yourself, what each of, what each of these uh, patterns are. And then I'm going to start it right about now. Okay, so the first one I see the carbon with the bromine has three other carbons attached. That's going to be tertiary. I look at the carbon with the bromine. I see one other carbon attached. That's going to be primary. I look at the, the bromine directly attached to the double bond. That's going to be vinyl, not very reactive. I look at the carbon with the bromine. There's one other carbon attached. That's going to be primary. 
But if the bromine attached to a methyl, that's unique. That's a methyl bromide or bromomethane. I look at the carbon with the bromine attached to two other carbons, that's going to be secondary. Bromine directly attached to the benzene ring, that's going to be phenyl, very unreactive. Uh, bromine attached to a carbon with only one other carbon attached is primary, that's good for SN2, but also there's a double bond here, and that makes um, for resonance stabilization, that's going to be very reactive. Uh, I look at the carbon with the bromine, it has two carbons attached, that's going to be secondary. I look at the carbon with the bromine, one other carbon attached, that's going to be primary, but it's right adjacent to the benzene ring, so this will be benzyl, very reactive. I look at the carbon with the bromine, one other carbon attached, so that's primary, but I have the neopenthyl pattern here, so that's going to be unreactive by all four mechanisms. I look at the carbon with the bromine, it's attached to two carbons, so that's secondary, but I also have the double bond here, so it's allylic. And finally, I look at the carbon attached to the bromine, has two other carbons attached, so that's secondary. Uh, it has a neopenthyl side over here, which is unreactive to SN2, but it does have this side over here, which allows reaction by all the other mechanisms. Okay, so hopefully you're familiar with all those. Now, the problem with the minus charges. Okay, we got a lot of minus charges. This is by no means all the possibilities, but this gives a certain sampling of them. So if you look, I've grouped them together. This is oxygen, 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 oxygen. Four oxygen minus uh, charges, um, anions. So uh, we want to distinguish each of these because they are a little bit alike and a little bit different. The first two are, are alike completely in our course. So I have sodium hydroxide. We'll be able to buy that right out of the bottle. You can use it whenever you want. If you look at the conjugate acid pKa, which is water, pretty high, 16. So this is pretty basic. That's going to affect its uh, uh, reaction characteristics at a secondary center. If I look at this, this is a sodium alkoxide. The alkoxide is the conjugate base of an alcohol, almost exactly the same pKa. And the chemistry is, is almost identical for these two, except one brings in an H and one brings in a carbon. Now, if I look at this oxygen minus, it's stabilized by resonance on the other oxygen. Uh, and so this is going to be very stable. This is the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid. So it's a carboxylate. Look at the pKa. pKa is 5, meaning it's much easier to form this conjugate base than these two over here. So it's very well behaved, and the place where we'll see a difference is that secondary bromoalkanes. This last one, if you look at the pKa, is super basic compared to these guys. Uh, 19 versus 16, that's like 10 to the 3 different. Also, it has three methyls, which makes it very sterically bulky. And so this one will not do SN2 except at a methyl. Otherwise, it will be E2. This is one you got to remember special from the other guys. Uh, we have two sulfur possibilities that are minus. They're basically identical. Very good nucleophiles. SN2 is going to win at everything but a tertiary center. So this will make a thiol, and this will make a thioether, or a sulfide. I have two nitrogen examples. One is very stable minus charge. That's the azide anion. And uh, that will be uh, a very good nucleophile, at methyl primary and secondary. But of course, tertiary, our rule is always E2. This is very basic. Look at the pKa, 37 versus 5. This is super, super basic, and I have two R groups. Sometimes those can be kind of big, and so this will always be a base. The only thing this will do is E2 reactions or pull off a proton. Okay, I have a couple carbon examples over here that look just alike. They both are triple bonds, but one has a nitrogen at the end of the triple bond, and one has a carbon at the end of the triple bond. This is cyanide. You get it right out of the bottle. You can use it whenever you 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 can use this whenever you want. The uh, terminal acetylide you have to make, there would be a hydrogen here, and you would have to pull that off. You pull that off with this base over here, the dialkyl amine. So that would give us a good carbon nucleophile. So at methyl and primary, we view these two the same. But at secondary, because this is more stable, it does SN2 well, and this one does mainly E2. Of course, at tertiary, they both do E2. This is an enolate. We would have to make that. There would be a hydrogen here that we would have to pull off. Again, we use the same guy, the dialkyl amide. Pull that off. And so this is a ketone enolate. I will give you one ketone at the start in this topic, and we'll use that as to learn the chemistry. But after chapter 10, 
we can make any ketone we want. And so uh, we use this as an enolate. We'll, we'll, we will consider it a good nucleophile SN2 at uh, methyl primary and secondary. This is the conjugate base of an alkane. It's the most powerful base in our course, you know, in all of our chemistry. It's even stronger than a dialkyl amide. Uh, it has a lot of uses, but uh, for right now, we'll just use it as a base. Later on, when we get to organometallics, uh, we'll use it a different way. And then these are both hydrides. You can use either one, sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. I put the Ds here, so when they react, D is just an isotope of hydrogen. But when it reacts, we can see the D where it occurs in the molecule. And so I'll be able to tell how you propose the reaction to work. And then the last one is another form of hydride, but just simple bare bones hydride. And this is super basic, very reactive. You can see the pK is 37. So it will always be a base in our course. And in fact, this is how we make the alkoxide over here. We use the sodium hydride to pull off a proton from an alcohol to make this. Okay, so what makes these all alike? They're all minus charges. So these are our nucleophile bases that are strong. They're all anions. Okay, so in each case, I've selected a few to compare. So we have the oxygen comparisons up here. Uh, we have the sulfur. There, no comparison there. They're just great nucleophiles. But we have two types of nitrogen. We have a really good, stable one and a very highly reactive basic one. And then we have a couple types of hydride. We have the fairly stable aluminum hydride or borohydride. And then we have the bare bones hydride that's very reactive. Our weak nucleophile bases are easy. Okay, we have water, we have simple alcohols, methanol, ethanol, and we have simple carboxylic acids. So I do give you one acid. I give you ethanoic acid, which is also called acetic acid for right now, but after chapter 10, we'll be able to make any acid that we want. Okay, so that will expand. For right now, we're going to leave the acid out. Okay, we're only going to use these two weak base nucleophiles, so that will keep it pretty easy. So how are these all alike? Well, they're all neutral, so they do not participate in the reaction. These are going to be our SN1E1 reactions. They're all protic. Okay, so being protic, they're very good at stabilizing positive and negative charge, which is important to the SN1E1 reaction, since that forms right away. Uh, they all have an OH. Once the reaction occurs, we'll have to lose one of those H's from each guy. Uh, they are conjugate acids of 1, 2, and 3 on the previous slide. So if we go back and look at that, 1, 2, and 3, conjugate acid of hydroxide, water, conjugate acid of alkoxide would be alcohol, conjugate acid of a carboxylate would be a carboxylic acid, which you can see up here. Um, all of these, because they're neutral, require for the bromoalkane to become reactive. So the bromine will leave, we'll make a carbocation that forces these guys to react. So let's just take a look now at the conjugate acids again to remind ourselves. So what I'm asking in this first one is, what is the conjugate acid of oxide? Well, the way we would do that is we would put a proton on, and that would make it into hydroxide over here. Okay. If I wanted the conjugate acid of hydroxide, I would put a proton on, and that would make it into water that we see right here. If I wanted the conjugate acid of water, I would put a proton on, and that would make it into a hydronium ion, which we see right here. If I wanted the conjugate acid of H3O+, plus, there isn't one. I would have to put a proton on. I would have H4O plus 2, and uh, I don't think any of us have ever written something like that. Now, this is our chemical catalog. You can use any of these guys whenever you want to make the things that we need for our chemistry. So sodium hydroxide, anytime you need hydroxide, there it is. Uh, potassium t-butoxide, if you need that, we use that. Remember, that's a big bulky base, mainly for E2 reactions, even at a primary center. Uh, you can use it whenever you want. The sodium hydrogen sulfide that we have here, you can use it whenever you want. Uh, sodium azide, you can use it whenever you want. Sodium cyanide, sodium borohydride, lithium aluminum hydride, sodium hydride, n-butyl lithium, uh, lithium dialkyl amide. You can use any of those whenever you want. If you think back to the previous slide or two, uh, I had an enolate here. I had to take that proton off. 
So we'll have to make the enolate from this. I give this to you right now, but like I said, after chapter 10, you'll make any one that you need. Uh, and we pulled that proton off with the dialkyl amide. Uh, here's a, an alkyne, so I'm giving this to you right now, but pretty soon we'll have to make this ourselves. Uh, again, to take that proton off to make the acetylide, I use the dialkyl amide. It's a very strong base. And then these are our weak base nucleophiles. So these two we'll use in SN1 and E1 reactions. This one we could, but what we're going to use it for in this topic is to take this proton off and make the carboxylate. That's a good base nucleophile. And to take that proton off, we'll use sodium hydroxide. That's what you did probably in freshman chemistry and your titrations. So this is how we can do each of these. Say I need the alkoxide. Then I would have to come get an alcohol, something like this, and react it with sodium hydride, something like this. And that would give me the alkoxide. Say I needed to make a carboxylate, something like this. I would need to come get the carboxylic acid and react it with sodium hydroxide to get the carboxylate. Say I needed a thiolate. Well, we don't have a thiolate up here. We would have to make the thiolate with a bromoalkane. And then we would have to come on and take off that proton. That would require sodium hydroxide. We get the thiolate. Uh, if we had an alkyne, I give it to you here, but you'll have to make it soon. The way we pull off this proton, again, is with the dialkyl amide, and, I, and that gives us a terminal acetylide. And here's the ketone, the only ketone for right now, but then we use the dialkyl amide, pull that proton off, and now we have the enolate. Okay? So these are some things that you need to make, but you have all the ingredients up here to make them, but you got to know how to make them. Just a reminder of acid-base chemistry, uh, we had very strong acid, HBr, and that reacted 100% with water, even though water is a weak base, 100%. If we use hydroxide, well, how can you go over 100%? It's going to be a stronger base, but still it's a 100% reaction. We couldn't tell the difference between these two unless we had a weaker, base, a weaker acid. So here's a weaker acid. This is ethanoic acid or acetic acid. If you react that with water from freshman chemistry, maybe you remember, partly dissociates maybe half a percent. So we make a carboxylate. That's not going to be real useful to us. But if we use hydroxide, then it's a 100% reaction to get the carboxylate. And you can compare the equilibrium over here. Okay? 10 to the 11th is more than 100%. Now, we're going to take those same guys and apply them to a new situation in this topic, which is attack carbon. So if I use water to attack the bromomethane, this is going to be a lousy reaction because this is a weak nucleophile. Uh, and uh, bromomethane doesn't react by SN1E1 reaction. Can't make the carbocation. But if I use hydroxide, hydroxide is powerful enough to come over and push off the bromide. has to come from the backside. So notice two arrows here. And we get a new product, which is an alcohol. So notice we went from a bromoalkane to an alcohol. We're going to be able to make a lot of different functional groups using this strategy. So this is just an example. Now, I made the molecule a little bigger because I want to show the competing reaction. So now I have two carbons here. C-alpha is the carbon with the bromine. C-beta is any carbon attached to this carbon. And I only have one here. If I have hydrogens on this carbon, then I could arrange the hydrogen so that it is anti to the C-alpha bromine bond. Okay. And that will allow overlap between these two orbitals to make a pi bond. Okay, So up here I have just the first reaction we talked about, SN2. But the competing reaction, the hydroxide would attack the anti-C beta H to the C alpha X. Okay, That has to be anti. Because again, I need the parallel overlap to make the pi bond. But if I have this arrangement, then I can make an alkene over here. All right. Now, in reality, this is spinning around tens of thousands of times per second. And that's going to uh, mean most of the time it's not going to be able to work. But if, it, if this crashes in here right when it's anti, then it can do this elimination reaction. So it's sort of a competition, both coming from the same side, backside to attack the C alpha carbon or the anti C beta H. Now, you might say there's another place where these two are parallel, and that would be if they were sin. So if they were eclipsed and sent to each other, that would be parallel, and that should work. The problem is this is eclipsed. And so when we look at the eclipse conformation, it's higher. We only have just a fraction of a percent. So over 99% will occur in this kind of a conformation 
and that's why we only show this one. Okay. So notice the orbitals are parallel when it's anti, and the orbitals are parallel when it's sin, but over 99% of our molecules will be in this conformation. I put them both together in this slide. So you'll notice that we write B minus when it's attacking a C beta H, and we write NU minus when it's attacking a C alpha carbon. And that's because we give it a different name depending on what it attacks. Okay, the only time we call it a base is when it attacks a hydrogen. Every place else, when it attacks something, we call it a nucleophile. I'm showing a carbon here, but we can also attack other atoms. We can attack sulfur, we can attack nitrogen, we can attack chlorine or bromine. There's all kinds of atoms we could attack. And when we do, we will call this a nucleophile. But right now, we're just attacking carbon. So we'll get this distribution over here. And here's where we have to worry about the little details to decide which one of these two guys is going to be the winner. Okay? But you've got to know how both form, and then you have to know which one is the major product. Okay, so here's our terms again. You might take a look at those. Here's our kinetics. They're both bimolecular kinetics. Here's our leaving groups. We're only going to use bromine. We also have chlorine, iodine, tosylate, protonated alcohol. Okay, and so let's take a look now. Oh, oh. Yeah, so this is a little more messy than acid-base chemistry, because acid-base chemistry was always the same. Attack the proton, push the conjugate base away. There's a lot more ambiguity here, and that's what makes organic a little bit challenging, is because you have a lot of choices. This is just to show that the SN2 reaction is a single, concerted, one-step reaction. Okay? We start with the product of reactants, our strong base nucleophile. It has to come from the backside. And at the very top up here, you'll notice I've jammed 10 electrons around this carbon. I have the incoming electrons coming on as the outgoing electrons are leaving with the bromide. And so for this moment right here, we have 10 electrons around the carbon, which makes it very high energy. And so that's the, the slow part of the reaction. It depends on both of these. And then we make the products stronger carbon-oxygen bond, very stable bromide anion. And those are going to be uh, favorable, so delta G will be negative. We call that exergonic. The size of this hill is the activation energy, and that determines the rate. Now, the way the reaction occurs for SN2 is always the same. They call it Walden inversion. The nucleophile always comes from the back side, and the leaving group leaves on the front side. The electrons are all pushed to the left here because of the electrons in the CX bond. But when the nucleophile makes the bond, it's going to push all of these groups over to the right. And so the configuration here will invert. Now I put the numbers here, 2, 3, 4, to establish a priority so that we can call it RRS. X is considered to be number 1. It's going to be a bromine. And so if I had 1, 2, I can see I'm going, let me see, I'll have to use my hand for this. 1, 2, circle it around, and I remember your arm would be up here for, and what I see is um, S. Yeah, yes. Okay, and so that would be S in 2. Now, what should happen over here, if that's truly inversion, is this should be R. So again, I'll use my arm. My arm will be 4. This will be my pointer finger. And I see 1, 2. So I get R, uh, clockwise rotation. Right. All S in 2 reactions occur with inversion of configuration. So here's the E2 reaction. Looks kind of similar if you look at the energy diagram. We start off with our reactants. Okay. And then the electrons come to the hydrogen on the C beta H. The electrons in the sigma bond are going to make the pi electrons right here. And then these electrons will be taken away with the bromide. So right in the transition state, again, we have too many electrons jammed into this complex. This sort of flattens out, as this is coming on and this is going away. And we're going to make the pi bond right here. So you'll notice when we do that, that the groups in the back, in this case R3 and R1, they're going to be on the opposite, the, uh, the back side of this pi bond that I have here, R3 and R1. The groups on the front, R4 and R2, are the wedges out here, R4 and R2. That's going to be locked in based on the anti-conformation uh, that we had over here. And so that's going to depend on what the, these groups are. You might get E, you might get Z. Okay. Again, uh, they start off with some energy. We go way up in energy because of the too many electrons in the transition state. 
as soon as we start to have the bromide leave and make the alkene, everything gets more stable. And so we get an exergonic reaction of products over here. So these two reactions are competing with each other, and it's going to depend on the activation energy as to which one wins. All right. So if SN2 is the winner, that means SN2 activation energy is lower than E2 activation energy. And so there'll be certain features that uh, make that more favorable, like not very much steric hindrance, like the base nucleophile is more stable, meaning the conjugate acid has a lower pKa. Okay, so that'll be, uh, uh, SN2 would be favored. However, if we go to the opposite, the nucleophile base is very basic. Has a, a conjugate acid has a high pKa. It's sterically hindered, and that's going to slow the SN2, and by default, E2 will become more competitive and can become the major product. Okay? Now, what is it about SN2 that uh, causes this to happen? Well, I have a series here. I have a methyl, a primary, a secondary, a tertiary. So again, we're looking at general patterns. Now you might think we would start off with one here for the methyl, but they don't. They start off with the ethyl being number one. Okay, they just call it whatever its rate is, they reference it to one. Now, if I took um, this methyl away and put a hydrogen, so it would look something like this. And the nucleophile comes up on the back side, it's going to be very sterically unhindered. This is as good as it gets for doing the SN2, push that guy away. So if we compare that to bringing in one R group, so in this case it's a methyl, but could be methyl primary, methyl ethyl, something like that, uh, then this becomes a region where the nucleophile cannot approach from the back side. Okay, it's going to be blocked. But I have two routes of access here. It's still pretty good for the nucleophile. And so for our, almost all of our reactions, SN2 is always the winner. Remember, only one. If this guy is really big and basic, T-butoxide, then even here at primary, E2 is going to be the main product. Now if I come along and replace another hydrogen with an R group, so I have two big groups that the nucleophile can't get through, I still have one little hydrogen out here I can sneak in on that side, and so what we should see is the rate should go down, and it does. So the methyl, without any steric hindrance, is 30. Our reference compound, ethyl, is 1, and then the secondary one drops off to about 1 40th. So there are kind of similar differences between these, 1 30th, 1 40th. But if we go to three large bulky groups, I got a lot of electron density in the backside here. The nucleophile is bringing up its electrons, and it gets bumped away, can't get in there. And so uh, for tertiary, the amount of SN2 is zero. Okay? We say no reaction. So if you have a minus charged nucleophile base and it's tertiary, your only choice is going to be E2 reaction. Now notice we do have a lot of C beta H's. Here's a C beta H, C beta H, C beta H. So E2 is definitely a possibility, but not SN2. Okay, so uh, my comment on steric effects, uh, big groups get in the way. In this case, it's bad. It's slowing the reaction down. And in another example later in this topic, big groups will be good. And they will help the reaction go faster. Okay, and all of these things... It's good to use your imagination. Think about them, you know, in whatever way works for you. Uh, think of the little world of the molecules and how they're coming in and reacting. If you have models, you can use models to kind of show you what's going on too. Now, it would seem like C alpha is all we have to consider, but that's not the case. We also have to consider what's going on at C beta. Okay, so C beta is the carbon attached to C alpha. So here again is our reference, ethyl, that's 1. Okay. C alpha has the X and C beta is over here. I have only hydrogens here, so whatever speed it is, we call that 1. Now if I come along and put in R group here, we'll just say it's a methyl. Then that, for a moment, think of these two as hydrogens. Some of the rotations around will have that methyl sitting right here. And that methyl will drop down a hydrogen to the backside, and the nucleophile will not be able to get through whenever that happens. However, if there were two hydrogens here, like we have up here, then um, there'll be plenty of opportunity for the nucleophile to get in, just not as good as the ethyl. And so we do see a little fall off, but it's very minor. This is a reacting about half as fast as the uh, reference over here. Now if I come along and put two methyls on, okay, and then it looks something like this. 
So if the methyl is sitting in the back, I got the problem that I just talked about that's going to shut down the SN2. But I still have an option where the reaction can occur if they're pointing out here and the hydrogen's here. I can still do the SN2. So the SN2 will get slower for sure. Uh, get slower by about maybe 30 fold or so. Okay. So 30 times slower than the unsubstituted one. Now if I go to all three being methyls, then I have this situation here. No matter what I rotate behind, I'm going to have some group sticking down in the back. I will not be able to get to an SN2. So there will be no SN2 at neopental centers, which is what this is. All right. Also notice there's no C beta H. I can't do an E2 reaction either for the neopental center. So neopentals are dead to everything. Okay, so what should we be looking for? Charge on the nucleophile is number one. If it's negative, it favors the two reactions, SN2 and E2. If it's neutral, it favors the one reactions, SN1 and E1. Uh, we're concerned about the basicity of the nucleophile. Uh, if the uh, has a higher pK for its conjugate acid, it's very, very reactive, very basic. That's going to favor at E2. If it has a lower pKa, when the atoms are similar, uh, that'll favor SN2. So we have almost a situation for every single one, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the carbon, and the hydrogen. Okay, And all these comparisons, I'm mainly looking at secondary because that's where the problem is. Uh, if we look at the size of the nucleophile, the bigger things get, meaning more steric hindrance, uh, the more E2 we tend to see. Okay? The smaller things are, the more SN2 is favored. T-butoxide is very big, so that's going to favor E2, and it's very basic. That's going to favor E2, even at a primary center. That was our one exception. Uh, substitution pattern at both C alpha and C beta tend to slow down SN2. And so that's going to favor E2 as long as we do have a C beta H. Okay? If we don't have a C beta H, then E2 is not going to work either. The solvent is very important, but uh, we're not going to worry about it. Too complicated for us to worry about. So I have summarized here all of the things that we've been talking about. Methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. On this slide, I have these anions, and on the next slide, I have some more anions. But uh, I have what are the uh, observed results on each of these. So if you look at hydroxide and alkoxide, they are almost identical down the line. Only SN2 at methyls, we said, with a minus charge. Mostly SN2 at primary, except T-butoxide over here. Okay. The dialkyl amides are only bases, so if we were to use it with a primary, it would be E2. At secondary, uh, it's more hindered, sterically hindered. If this is very basic, which 16 is getting in that range, then E2 is going to be favored over SN2. However, this is not very basic. Look at the pK of the acid. This is very stable, and it does more SN2 over E2, even at secondary. Uh, T-butoxide, too basic, too big. If we look at the uh, azide, very good nucleophile, so SN2 is favored. And then if we look at the diocamid, it's always E2. If we go to tertiary, it's too bulky. The bromoalkane is too bulky. All we get is E2 for everything. E2, 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 E2. Okay. If we look at these anions here, notice I'm comparing the two triple bond uh, carbanions. The cyanide, pretty stable. Low pKa for the acid. So it's going to be well behaved at the secondary center. We, we see mostly SN2. Um, everything, of course, for methyl is SN2. And uh, everything at primary is mostly SN2 over E2, except for T-butoxide. If you go to secondary, here's where we got the problem. Uh, the only one we worry about here is this is too basic. That secondary gets more E2 than SN2. Uh, otherwise, everything else is good SN2 at secondary. Our rule, just to be easier for tertiary centers, is everything does E2. Okay, So that doesn't make any difference how good the nucleophiles they are. It's only E2. Okay, So remember, methyl and tertiary are absolutes. Set, my primary is almost always the same except T-butoxide. And then secondary has a few exceptions back and forth. Uh, that you got to keep track of those. Depends on how sterically big and how basic is a uh, nucleophile base.
Okay, so just absolutes, always do SN2, backside attack, invert the configuration, add our methyl. That's the only reaction we have. If it's uh, neutral, there's no, no result, no reaction. All strong base nucleophiles only react by E2 at tertiary centers. So there is no SN2 here, only E2. Uh, I made this one so that uh, this is an ethyl side chain and these two are methyl side chains. So we got two different types of alkenes just to show you that each side chain could be a little different. That's one of the problems of E2. And notice anti C beta H, C alpha X, every single time. Backside attack and version of configuration, every single time. Okay, these are absolutes. So what I'm looking at on these, this side here is uh, primaries with all the oxygen guys. So I have hydroxide. Hydroxide is good at primary, so we get mainly uh, SN2. A little bit of E2, we're aware of it, but we don't emphasize it. Notice that we took a bromoalkane and we made it into an alcohol. Okay, So this is big. This is a way of making alcohols. We're going to need those in the future. If I use instead the alkoxide, it reacts almost exactly like the hydroxide. It does a little bit of E2, but mainly SN2. Now when you look at this, we have a carbon, oxygen, carbon. This is an ether. So now we've got a way of making alcohols, and we've got a way of making ethers. Remember how we made this. We used sodium hydride, hydride with an alcohol. Okay, and then I have carboxylates, very well-behaved nucleophiles, so they give a lot of SN2 over E2, okay, even at uh, secondary. So certainly at primary, this is going to be SN2 is the winner. But notice what we make. We make an ester. So just on this slide, we've got an alcohol, we've got an ether, we've got an ester. This, of course, is all at primary centers. On the other hand, if I react this with T-butoxide, we mainly get E1. Okay, I'm sorry, E2 reactions. So we get an alkene. So we have alcohol, ether, ester, alkene at primary centers are possible. If we didn't have this guy, then we wouldn't have any winner, E2 winner, of a reaction at a primary center. And so this gives us a choice that we can make this alkene. That's good. Okay. And then you look at the PKAs. A little bit higher tends to favor E2, except this is primary, so SN2 wins. This is pretty low, pretty stable. This is good for SN2 reactions. And this is too high and too sterically bulky, so we get mainly E2. So notice what I did here. I, I have now a secondary center. The carbon, the C-alpha carbon with the bromine is chiral, because I got an ethyl, a methyl, a hydrogen, and a bromine. I'll be able to see if I come from the back side and push that off and make that alcohol. It'll be a version of configuration. So you might check the absolute configuration there, see if that's true. I see one, two, I see this as an S. One, two, this is as an R. You might double check that. I get a little alkene, I'm not going to worry about that. But notice I did it up here and I did it down here. If I do it down here, I get a mono-substituted alkene. But if I do it up here, I get a di-substituted alkene. If I take this H, I get E, or trans. If I move it over and take this H, I get E or Z. Or Z. Okay, so that's a lot of possibilities. Uh, the ethoxide, the alkoxide is going to be exactly the same, except I'll get an ether and the same alkenes. Ether will be the main product because it's at a primary center. If I use the carboxylate, ethanoate, this is going to be a very good SN2, so that would be the main product. And uh, that would be it. I get a little bit of E2, if any at all, with the same possibilities for all three. If I use the T-butoxide, well, just E2. So I'm going to get three different alkenes, the 1 alkene, and the E and the Z2 alkene. Okay. These are the PKAs again, 16, 16. So these conjugate bases are pretty basic. And then uh, PKA5, this is pretty stable, not, not real basic, because the conjugate acid is not real acidic. But if I look at this one, PK of 19, it's a thousand times more than these guys up here, and it's big and bulky. And so we're looking at E2. Okay, here I'm looking at the triple bond carbons. This side I have the stabilizing nitrogen for the minus charge, electronegativity helping pull that away. 
So uh, the conjugate acid will have a pKa of 9. Okay, that's, that's pretty uh, pretty low pKa. Over here, if I had an agent pulled it off, the pKa would be 25 for the terminal acetylene. So at methyl, these are both good nucleophiles. So I mainly get um, SN2. At primary, same thing. I mainly get SN2, but I do have the possibility of a little bit of E2. So you just want to be aware of that. But for both of these, mainly SN2. If I go to secondary, now they diverge. The more stable one gives me more SN2. That's a cyanide. And the less stable one gives me more E2. So it's not useful for bringing this into the carbon and making that carbon-carbon bond. If I go to tertiary, well, everything is E2 at tertiary. They're both negatively charged nucleophile bases, so we, we only get E2. So these would be the answers that you see right here. Okay. And then I think on the next slide, I think I duplicated this one. Looks like the same, same. Somehow I duplicated that. So we'll just skip over that. These are actual the actual reactions, so you can see the main product. I didn't draw all the products. So mainly SN2, we come from the backside. Now look what happened. We took a bromoalkane and we made a nitrile. All right, so now with that cyanide, we can make nitriles, which can be made into maybe five different other groups. On this side here, I take my terminal acetylide and react it at the bromoalkane, the methyl, and I make a bigger alkyne. So this is good, because we can make the alkyne into different things too. Over here, I react at the primary. Well, that's going to be SN2. That's a good reaction. I make a nitrile. Over here, I react at a primary. That's going to be SN2. And I make a bigger alkyne. Okay. Uh, secondary, they diverge. So at a secondary, I'm going to get uh, a nitrile. But on the um, terminal alkyne, it's too basic. And I get uh, the E2 products, which is not what I want. If we go to tertiary, everything at tertiary is E2. So that's all we see is alkenes here. If we come down and look at the pKa's of the conjugate acid, conjugate acid of cyanide is hydrogen cyanide, pKa of 9. So that's pretty stable anion, pretty low pKa, pretty strong acid. If I look at uh, the terminal acetylide, that would be an alkyne, and uh, pKa is 25, much, much, uh, much less strong in acid, so very weak acid, and much more reactive uh, base up here, so more E2 favored. Okay, we're going to look at some nitrogen examples now. This is the azide, super stable minus charge. It's got a lot of electronegative atoms, three nitrogens. It's got resonance on both the end nitrogens, uh, so very good nucleophile. So I skipped over the methyl and primary. I'm at the secondary here, and you can see that I should get an SN2, push that off, would look something like this. This now is an azido compound. Okay, this would be a one azido propane. We could call that. Uh, we don't really want the azide because the azide is uh, very toxic and the azide is very explosive. So generally, we decompose this. We never really isolate these as pure compounds. So what we're going to do to this is we're going to react it with lithium aluminum hydride over here. Okay, I wrote the azide in two different forms here. This resonance form shows two double bonds. This one puts a triple bond between the N2 nitrogens. And that's what I want to show because this is the leaving group. Okay, we're going to get nitrogen gas leaving group, probably the best leaving group in uh, organic chemistry. So we're going to come up here with this nucleophilic hydride, attack the backside of the nitrogen, not the carbon, and we push off the nitrogen gas. We're almost to an amine. I would need to protonate this. So this is very basic, and if we just do a little acidic workup, we can protonate that and get our primary amine. Okay, so this will be a very important way of making primary amines. This is now another group. So we, what do we make? We made alcohols and ethers and esters and alkenes, and um, what else did we make? Up here, just above, we go back. Oh, we made nitriles and alkynes, and now we've made amines, primary amines. We can make the amines into amides a little later, and then we can um, make these into secondary amines and tertiary amines too. 
So it's going to be a lot of stuff coming from this. This is going to be an important sequence that you got to know. We don't really stop at the azide. Our other nitrogen that we showed was this very, very basic, sterically bulky amide anion. So this is only going to be E2. If I have a secondary center, I'm just going to get the usual elimination products, which uh, we would show also with T-butoxide. Okay, so if you look at the pKa's, you can see how different they are. The azide's pretty stable. Acid has a low pKa. And then the, uh, uh, the dialkyl amide comes from a secondary amine. And that, the dialkyl amide is very unstable. You can see from the high pKa of the acid. Okay, the sulfur compounds are all super good nucleophiles. So methyl primary, secondary. It's all going to be SN2. Backside attack, invert, push off. Okay, so we come in from the backside push off. And that would give us a thiol. So now there's another functional group we can make as a thiol. Now we can take that thiol and we can pull a proton off by using sodium hydroxide and make the thiolate. Okay, the thiolate can do exactly the same thing we did up here. And so we could now get a sulfur joining up with that carbon. We'd have a carbon sulfur carbon bond. We call that a sulfide, or we could call it a sulfur ether. Okay, so that's yet another functional group we can make. So you see what's going on here. Both of these, uh, the sulfur minus is uh, pretty stable. You can tell by the um, pK of the conjugate acid, hydrogen sulfide or the thiol. Uh, the next example I have here is an enolate, and this enolate is of a ketone. I'm going to give you this ketone to start with. You'll have to make this from the dialkyl amide. This now can do an SN2. This is a secondary center. So we're going to show that SN2. So we have a break right here. I can tell the carbon next to the carbonyl is the one that had, could carry the electrons with the minus charge because of resonance. So that'll be where we joined that up, and the leaving group was over here. Uh, so this is a bigger ketone. So this is very uh, um, useful to us. Uh, we can also make enolates from esters. Remember, we have the carboxylate that can do SN2s on bromoalkanes. And we can also make enolates from nitriles. Remember, we had the cyanide that could attack bromoalkanes. So we can make these classes of compounds, and then we can use the dialkyl amide to make the enolates, and then we can do the same kind of chemistry I show here. Okay, so that's a lot of possibilities. Uh, the aluminum hydride is sodium borohydride. Um, it's going to be hydride, but I use deuteride because if I use deuteride and I do the SN2 reaction, I can tell where the reaction occurred. So remember, you're pushing the electrons, not the atoms. Push the electrons in, push the bromide off, invert everything over, and if I have a D, then I can see where the reaction happened. If I had an H, it would just blend in with all the other Hs. Also with the D here, this is a chiral center, so I can tell if that's R or S coming from this over here. Uh, just to show you the hydrides, uh, there's many forms of hydride, sodium hydride, potassium hydride, calcium hydride. Uh, we're just going to use sodium hydride. All the sodium hydride is for us is a very, very strong base that can pull a proton off of an alcohol and make an alkoxide. Okay, so that's the only thing that we will use the uh, sodium hydride for. However, lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride, these two guys here, are very commonly used. Aluminum hydride is a little more reactive than the borohydride, but for us, we'll just consider them the same. Uh, the deuterium compounds are also possible, but I just show you here they're much more expensive. Uh, if I looked at the borohydride, was that about 120 bucks a mole or so? The borohydride over here is about 2,000 plus dollars a mole. Aluminum hydride is about 46 dollars a mole. Over here, it's a thousand dollars a mole for the de deuterium. Uh, we don't really care because we're just using pencil and paper. So it doesn't cost us anything. If you look here, the electronegativities of the atoms, you can see boron and hydrogen are very close. And that's why it's not so reactive. Okay, hydride's a little bit more negative because it's more electronegative. But if I look at the aluminum of the hydride, much more polar bond. And so this is a much more powerful hydride reducing reaction, but also more dangerous. So if it should see water, you might have a fire start. Uh, but again, all our stuff is pencil and paper, so it doesn't bother us. 
Okay, and so that's about where I'm going to have to stop, and we'll, I'll pick up uh, for the next part, our second of three lectures uh, in the next series.